Now, the next slide shows some specific aspects of the long-acting injectable armamentarium that we have now. So these are the ones that you could presumably try a long-acting injectable instead of the oral for giving those adequate trials. And as you can see in the United States, among the first generation antipsychotics, we've got flufenazine and haloperidol. Although outside the U.S., there are some other first-generation long-necking injectables, such as flupenthixol, perfenazine, decanoate, pipotiazine, and zuclopenthixol are available outside the United States. Now, among the second-generation antipsychotics, which we do prefer generally for at least one, if not both, of the two trials prior to clozapine, the ones that have long-acting injectables are risperidone, olanzapine, paliperidone, and aripiprazole. The first-generation LAIs might be expected to cause more acute extrapyramidal symptoms, tardive dyskinesia, and hyperprolactinemia symptoms compared to most second-generation antipsychotics. It seems that the rate of movement disorders like tardive dyskinesia are similar with the long-acting injectables compared to the oral, so these are reasons to not particularly prefer them. Flufenazine decanoate and haloperidone decanoate also have a higher rate of movement disorders than the other LAIs, although they do have possibly lower risk of weight gain and lower costs in most places. As far as risperidone, the first of the long-acting injectable, second-generation LAIs, they have lower risk of movement disorder. They do have increased risk of prolactin elevation compared to the other second-generation antipsychotics. They do have a problem, though, with delayed release. It takes about three to six weeks. Some studies suggest it can be as long as six, although the package insert says that you should continue the oral for three weeks after starting the injections, and you should be able to then remove it. But some of the studies suggest that six weeks really would be better. That's, of course, rather impractical for someone who's an outpatient and who's non-adherent. How are they going to comply with the oral results continuing for those whole six weeks? And this may have something to do with the poor performance of risperidone consta in the 2007 California Medicaid study. You can and should supplement with oral risperidone, and that may improve your results. Paliperidone palmitate was the second one that became available. It does not require much oral supplementation. You only have to give it for a two-day period just prior to starting the IM to demonstrate tolerability. You can also use a short-acting IM version of paliperidone as a lead-in to your long-acting injectable, two injections once a day, if they absolutely won't take oral. And a real advantage to paliperidone palmitate in being able to get it going right away. The usual process is to start with a 256 milligram IM injection, and then a week later you can give the 156 milligram dose and then continue for the average patient 156 every four weeks. So this gets them up to therapeutic concentration rapidly without the need for the oral supplementation. Subsequent injections, as I said, would be every four weeks for the Sistena version. But there's also now a three-month formulation in Vega Trinza, which may be started after four months on the monthly paliperidone palmitate, and the usual dose of that is 565 milligrams every three months. The next option is olanzapine pomoate. It's similar to oral olanzapine in both effectiveness and side effects. It does have a new side effect, though, that developed called post-injection delirium or sedation syndrome. This was seen in about 1.4% of patients treated. It's due to occasional inadvertent injection going into the blood vessel, and that is what can result in this experience of delirium or extreme sedation. And because of this possible side effect, there's a requirement that patients have to be observed in your office for three hours after each injection, and you must have facilities for immediate transfer to hospital care if they should develop symptoms of the syndrome. And the drug company in the United States uh, only licenses certain clinics that ha can demonstrate that they have those abilities before they will allow the drug to be prescribed. And these precautions certainly make olanzapine pomoate rather impractical. Other clinical features can include sedation, confusion, dizziness, dysarthria, somnolence, and as I said, there are even some cases of unconsciousness from the injections. And finally, among the newer antipsychotics, we have aripiprazole, 
which has now several forms. We have aripiprazole monohydrate, goes by the brand name Abilify Maintena. And there's another company making it, a very similar product called aripiprazole lauroxil, which goes by the brand name Aristata. These long-acting injectables require two weeks of initial oral treatment. And then they also require oral supplementation, like Respiridone Consta does, for three weeks. So it has those disadvantages. It comes in the monthly version, which is the Abilify Maintena, 400 milligrams once a month. And the Lauroxel version comes in three different dosaging. There's a 441 to 882 milligram once monthly version. There's an 882 milligram version that is every six weeks. And just recently, they marketed a 1,064 milligram injection, which is good for two months. And some barriers that are important to mention on the use of LAIs in general, which is stigma and also cost. Most of these new ones cost more than $1,000 a month, sometimes considerably more than that, U.S. dollars. So again, to repeat the key points about the long-acting injectables, the LAIs, flufenazine decanoate and haloperidone decanoate, have higher rates of movement problems, lower risk of weight gain, and lower costs. Olanzapine pomoate requires patients to get the special observation for three hours, making use impractical. And aripiprazole and respiridone LAIs require oral supplementation, but paliperidone does not. And overall, we think the, perhaps the most critical and important use is to enable really good, adequate trials early in the course of schizophrenia so you can be firm in your conclusion that the patient is suboptimally responsive to these kinds of agent and should be a candidate for clozapine.